I've had this shirt since high school, baby. Welcome to That's Good Broncos, now featuring the best Irish dancing on this planet. Thank you, Broncos Europe, for reposting that on Instagram. I had no idea the Gardner brothers were Broncos fans. I have to believe this is good luck. And one day, I will pay them a handsome fee to perform this exact dance on Tom Brady's grave. It's the big Broncos Steelers prediction episode. Will Keys and I have exhausted ourselves watching the All-22, which we had access to immediately, and came up with some keen observations about the Steelers and Broncos that you will not find anywhere else. Jake Butt is making headlines for all of the right reasons, if you know what I mean. Butt, ready for some action, wrote one paper, to which Butt replied, NSFW, 18 and older. My headline though, Butt, opening for big finish this weekend. That's how you write a headline, Bronco Steelers. That's good, Broncos. Yeah, you can subscribe to this YouTube channel, but you can also subscribe, subscribe to the That's Good Broncos podcast, now available everywhere you listen to podcasts. Uh, I've partnered with DNVR, and they are helping me with the pods. We announced our partnership this week, so make sure you give them some love. And if you're a Broncos, Nuggets, Avalanche, or Rockies fan, they have a bunch of great people covering all Colorado sports, writing, podcasting, making videos. They do it all. And they, they also have the best merch in the game. And now you can use my code PERNA to get discounts on shirts like Fraud City their diehard shirts, which are awesome, and of course, Philip Lindsay's giant mug. Put his face on your chest with code PERNA at the DNVR locker. Now let's begin with some Brett Coleman style quarterback analysis. Drunk Brett Coleman, who just watches highlights. Now, Big Ben said that on Tuesday, he felt like he was in a train wreck. On Wednesday, he felt like he was in a car crash, and on Thursday, he hoped it would only feel like he fell off of a bike. Of course, Big Ben would know exactly what it feels like to fall off a bike. Now, in his first game back since week two last season, Ben threw for three touchdowns and no picks, albeit against a pretty suspect giant secondary that lost DeAndre Baker to armed robbery IR, eligible to return in 2028. He also outrushed Saquon Barkley, if that doesn't tell you how fricked up the fucking Giants are. Roethlisberger played poorly in his two appearances last year, failing to even throw a touchdown. But it seems like despite his elbow, he's closer to 2018 form where he led the league in passing yards. The last time he played Denver, he threw a 97 yard touchdown pass to Juju Smith-Schuster, but also <laughs> threw the game ceiling interception to noted clutch defensive lineman, Shelby Harris. Drew Locke, though, has never played the Pittsburgh Stillers, and uh, they may very well be the toughest defense he's ever faced in the NFL, as he makes his seventh career start. Now, that's not hyperbole either. Daniel Jones was the most pressured quarterback week one. The Steelers attack on opposing QBs is relentless, and that's carrying over from last year, so it's not a week one fluke like the Chargers win. Now, I thought Drew Locke did a lot more good than bad on Monday night against a tough Titans defense, making plays outside the pocket, and would have had better numbers if not for two crucial, crucial drops by Jerry Judy, who played well otherwise. Locke did look a little Josh Allen-y, on most of his deep sideline throws, but especially when he missed Nick Vanette in the end zone on a very routine pass. With a young quarterback, you have to take the good with the bad. That doesn't necessarily apply to Ben Roethlisberger off the field, however. So let's look at the Broncos offense against the Steelers defense. Jerry Judy said this week that in 20 years, the only thing he will remember about his NFL debut were his two drops. 
He also tweeted this week, failure is growth, which if true, means I should be seven fucking feet tall and that my man tool should be 10 inches flaccid. I've got a shack sized amount of growth and the 1500 videos on my YouTube channel is proof. Judy, in my opinion though, will be the most improved rookie from week one to week two. The Broncos are going to be in a tough spot without running back Philip Lindsay out with the turf toe, but they are getting Cortland Sutton back and should be graced by the debut of KJ Hamler who I assume will get limited snaps. Royce Freeman should see an increase in his workload. Uh, like I've mentioned before, he's a great back to have for this exact situation. Denver may activate running back Levante Bellamy, who I'd also love to see get some touches. The key to this game is managing the Steelers' pass rush. Locke has shown that he has a knack for feeling the pressure, but with TJ Watt ready to commit war crimes against Elijah Wilkinson, it's going to take some insane spidey senses to not take a sack or two or three or four in this game. On the other side, Bud Dupree was all over the field against the Giants, so Garrett Bowles will have his hands full on the left side. Hopefully not in the way we are used to. Now, Bowles was the highest graded Broncos lineman week one and had zero penalties. Dalton Reisner was the second highest graded. So my suggestion is if on the goal line, run the ball to the left side and do not shovel to the right. Joe Burrow is the quarterback you shovel with. Get it? The scary thing about the Steelers front seven is their big three. Not a reference to This Is Us, by the way, but their defensive linemen. Alualu, Hayward, and Tuit generate a ton of interior pressure in addition to TJ Watt and you, me, and Bud Dupree, who combined for 15 total pressures against the Giants. Hell, Cam Hayward walked away with the pick, ending the Giants' best drive of the game. Of course, nothing would make me happier than to see tight end Noah Fant burn Devin Bush in coverage a few times in this game. The Broncos were expected to take Bush with the 10th overall pick back in 2019, but traded down to 20, letting the Steelers trim picks for Bush while Denver added Noah Fant. Fant looked nearly unstoppable in the first half against the Titans, but didn't get targeted in the second half until the very last drive in the fourth quarter when Locke was just firing Hail Marys. Keep Fant involved for 60 minutes would be my advice. Then we've got the Broncos defense against that Steelers O. We already discussed Big Ben, the one Steelers quarterback Miles Garrett never tried to kill on live television. The question is, who will emerge as the number two receiver opposite Juju Smith-Schuster to give Pittsburgh that dual threat they have thrived on in the past? Based on the amount of snaps he played, that should be Deontay Johnson. He and Juju each played 55 snaps, and Johnson was targeted a team high 10 times in the passing game. But Dave Damashek revealed on our podcast he thinks Johnson will be the number one receiver moving forward, and Juju will resume the number two role. The guy I'm worried about, though, is rookie Chase Claypool. He had quite possibly the best sideline catch opening weekend, and was only thrown to twice. That catch, though, was so good that Pro Football Focus gave him the highest grade of any rookie week one. <laughs> he was thrown to twice, Pro Football Focus. Now, don't forget that the Steelers now employ two of the three Watt brothers. I think they call that two-thirds. What is? Look, I have no idea why Derek Watt chose to play fullback, while both of his brothers are now premier pass rushers. He's the type of guy who if the Watts started a band, like a roided out version of the Hanson brothers who can all squat a thousand pounds, would choose to play the bassoon. Uh, Derek, this is an emo punk band. You can't play the bassoon, bro. Uh, I'm my own man, JJ and TJ. If I wasn't, why does my name have so many more letters than yours? We're gonna make this boy band work with me and my bassoon, the most phallic of all the instruments, or we don't jam at all, brothers. JJ, TJ, you know, you know you're my favorite, but let your brother play the bassoon. It makes you a unique band. That's their loving mother from the other room. And that's what you call one what mama! At this point, I'm unsure of how good the Broncos secondary is. 
AJ Boye looked like uh, the best corner. He's now on IR for a few weeks. Bryce Callahan was kicking off the rust that builds after not playing for a full season. Rookies though, OJ Mudia and Isang Bassi were both graded in the top five for rookie corners last weekend, which if pro football focus grades corners like receivers, I'm guessing there were only five rookie corners playing. I do like that Devontae Bosby will be back in the mix because I think Denver will have their hands full trying to defend all of the Steelers ball catchers. Jarrell Casey proved to be worth his weight in gold. Well, at least in draft picks. He held his own on the line, got some pressures, and batted down two passes. I think he, and Shelby Harris can bat down more combined passes than any two defenders this season. Jeremiah Tauchu was decent, filling in for Von Miller. He tied for third in the league with five pressures and a sack, but the Broncos definitely need more from Bradley Chubb if Vic Fangio is going to sit back and only blitz like once a game. Steelers guards Stefan Wisniewski and David DeCastro are both banged up. Wisniewski, Wisniewski? was already filling in for DeCastro, and then Pittsburgh put tackle Zach Banner, uh, right tackle, on IR. If Denver wins this game, I think it will largely be due to their defensive line taking advantage of an ailing Steelers offensive line. That is X Factor number one. X Factor number two, KJ Hamler, makes exactly one electric play that changes the game for the Broncos. I'm talking bubble screen going for 80 yards and a touchdown. Will the Steelers kicker Chris Boswell miss four kicks? Probably not, but it should be evened out by the fact that this game will be played before Vic Fangio decides to call it a night and fall asleep in the fourth quarter. Another X factor, we know Cortland Sutton's shoulder is healthy enough to play, but is it strong enough to put Joe Hayden in a chokehold like Sterling Shepard did? I hope so. Final X Factor, Steelers backup right outside linebacker is Alex Highsmith, which is who Alex Smith would be if his favorite band was the Grateful Dead and he went to college one state east of Utah. My final prediction, not having fans at the home opener hurt the Broncos week one. I'm not sure anything will turn you into a COVID truther like your team blowing a late lead at home with no crowd noise. Week two, the no fans in the stands should help Denver on the road in a place normally very tough to play. Assuming Drew Locke can extend some plays and outmaneuver the Pittsburgh pass rush, I like the Broncos receivers against the Steelers secondary. Daniel Jones was 21 yards away from racking up 300 passing yards and one horrendous interception at the goal line away from possibly finishing with three tutties. Sutton is back. Hamler will be available, Judy will have stick him on his hands, and Locke will stop trying to replicate Josh Allen's throwing mechanics. Denver surprises everyone with a convincing win over the Steelers, 28-17. The curse of 16 gone. Two thirds. What is? Thanks for watching That's Good Broncos. Make sure you subscribe here on YouTube and subscribe to the That's Good Broncos podcast in iTunes and the other, the Google store, all of the podcast places. That's Good Broncos. Listen, love it, fuck it.